as a whole for inviting me here to talk tonight, on, uh, particularly on Bernardi's parish records. Um, I was on the Cork County Council, and as you know, the boundary, the city boundary, pushed away out in some cases, Lenmire, Benicali, and Blarney. And we're still scratching our heads as to how we're part of Cork City, but in the best night of here or there. So, being from Blarney, and uh, so near Cork City, I switched from the County Council to the City Council, and I'm with the City Library now. Um, I did several years on the local studies desk, local history desk in the County Library, um, which Karen, your colleague, has done also. And I'll be back at the library at the moment, but I'll be on the local studies desk of the City Library <coughs> um, sometime this year. I'll be, I'll be going over to that. Um, I've been interested in genealogy or family history. I kind of prefer to call it family history because I wouldn't see myself as an expert by any manner of means, but I would have a deep interest in the subject. So I would have been interested in family history since maybe teenage years, really, and uh, I continue to have that. And as you know yourselves, it's like a never ending jigsaw, a jigsaw with no limit the number of pieces, you can always be adding something. So um, history kind of does block the past, there's always something new coming up for us to learn. Um, our talk tonight um, will, um, the, the beginning of it, we'll kind of look at family uh, at parish records in a more general light. We'll kind of stick through that fast enough um, and we'll get on to a case study, if you like, with um, the parish of Blarney and the records that exist for that. And it'll be mostly the Catholic records that we'll look at. So our talk, our, our talk will be structured more or less in six sections. And um, it'll be heavily biased towards the last three there um, relating to Blarney. Um, maybe one or two of you will have an interest in Blarney Parish that will add to the, to the interest of the talk for you. Um, but hopefully everybody will find it um, um, interesting as a case study and the kind of peculiarities, the patterns, the trends that can arise in the records of a typical Irish parish. So, um, I suppose really a parish record is nothing more than ink on paper. Um, it, it tells us very little on the, on the surface of it. Uh, it tells us, it gives us no physical description of an individual. There's nothing about a person's height, their build, their colouring. And they say nothing of how a person spent their time on earth. Uh, the work they did, the pastimes they had, how they got along with their spouse, their children, their neighbours. They reveal nothing about personality. There's nothing about how kind the person was, or maybe how sarcastic the person might have been, uh, how tempestuous or how peaceful they were, how hard-working, or how, should we say, maybe relaxed they were. Um, so the information in the parish record is very scant indeed. But, nonetheless, for a great many people of the past, um, a parish record may be the only record um, of baptism or marriage surviving um, evidence surviving of their time on earth. There may be no other trace of their time on this earth other than an entry in a parish register. Now they may well have built stone walls or field divisions that still exist, but there's no name saying who did that. You know, this particular photograph is from a farm that was in my own one line of my own family. There were coyotes and um, Presumably it would date from the 19th century, and the family held that farm for most of the 19th century. Who built the wall? I don't know. Um, one thing we would say about parish records is that they're a great force for equality. And there, there's a great kind of democratic quality to them in the sense that everybody can be covered by them. The, um, you know, the, uh, the rights of the church were open to all. And um, of course, parish records, Catholic and other denominations, um, they're recognized as an important national asset, a very important record of the past. So how do we go about searching them? Well, the originals, as you know, um, in the case of the Catholic Church, are still held in the individual parishes. Um, what with uh, scarcity of clergy and pressure on time, it can be very hard to get to see the originals. And indeed, it's maybe not the best way to research them, considering wear and tear and things like that. 
Um, but if you are lucky enough to get some time to browse the records as I was um, in the start of the um, it can be a very rewarding experience. Um, luckily, there are substitutes, of course. Um, a lot of transcription has been done, and we just have a brief look at some of that. And the originals, they're not getting any younger, of course, and not, any, not getting any less worn. And once the originals are gone, they're gone for good. So they're very precious in that sense. And there is the case, or supposedly the case, of a parish um, somewhere outside the city, uh, where a very diligent housekeeper couldn't find any copies, old copies of the examiner lying around when she was preparing the priest's breakfast one morning. And uh, she saw an old book and ripped a few pages out of it. And that was those particular records that often spoke for good. And long before transcription was possible. Um, with regard to transcription, you're probably all familiar with what the National Library achieved in 2015 when they digitized their microfilm copies, which had been gathered in the 50s and 60s, and made them avail available online. Um, so you can search the country, really, from the, the comfort of your own home. Now, um, they're not keyboard searchable, so it is still the same as browsing them page by page, which can, of course, be very laborious. Um, digitization, then, where you can keyboard search, has more or less made it possible to find a needle in the haystack, which is an amazing kind of facility for research, really, that our ancestors didn't, I would say, and that we can enjoy. And you're probably aware of two websites that offer access to, to uh, almost all of our parish records. You have Roots Ireland, a clear website, offered by the Irish Family History Foundation, and that's said to encompass around 90% of our parish records. And that's a pay site, as you may be aware. And so you have to be careful as to how you search that. Uh, for example, if you had a particular ancestor, maybe by the name of Timothy Murphy, in your family history, and you brought up half a dozen records that were possibilities, you have to pick and choose carefully because you have to pay for each one. So that's probably most of the country. And the little bit in grey, the southwest, including the Diocese of Kerry and Cork and Ross, the diocese we're in at the moment, <coughs> and they're not available on that website. And as most of you probably know, they're available through Irish Genealogy, which is a free website. So that's fantastic if you have an interest in the Diocese of Kerry and Cork and Ross, and I think some Dublin parishes as well. But it's covering just about 10% of the country, so much, much less than uh, uh, Roots Ireland. But both sides keyboard searchable, whereas the National Library one is your browsing it. And um, now, uh, Church of Ireland records, there's often a feeling out there that um, Church of Ireland records they go further back than Catholic records. But that's only partly true. It is the case that as early as 1634, um, the, the Protestant parishes were instructed to keep records of christenings, marriages, and burials. That was started in 1634. And special registers were supplied by the Church, by the Church of Ireland. But only five pre-1650 registers uh, survive from that far back. And one of those is for um, the parish of Holy Trinity, centered on Christ Church on South Main Street, which the Triscan Art Centre had now moved into, as you might know. And that particular register was started by one Neptune Blood, that was his name, Neptune Blood. Not a particularly Christian name, but apparently he was born at sea, and that was how he came to have the name Neptune. So he started that register, and within that register there is a little note uh, concerning Blarney, so it gives us a very little early record. There's a little aside from 1666 saying to the woman of Blarney which kept the child that was at Sylvester's house 13 shillings. So, Holy Trinity or Christ Church records giving us a very early reference to Blarney. But on average, the stacking date for Church of Ireland records is between 1770 and 1820, so much later than those 17th century records. And so, on the whole, that whole are earlier than Catholic records, 1770 to 1820. And worse again, though, is the fate that most of them suffered, that the Catholic records hadn't suffered. Because when the Church of Ireland was disestablished, when its special position was taken down by, by the British government of the day, that was in 1870, um, the government asked 
for the records to be sent to the public record office in Dublin uh, if they couldn't be cleared for no within. So many Protestant church world parishes around the country, they sent their records up. And then um, the public record office was housed within the four courts. And come 1922, of course, you had a civil war and it's estimated that the records for nearly 1,000 church world parishes were destroyed and during the civil war at the four courts. So that's why they're often not in as good a state as Catholic records. Now it's not all so bleak. And 637 registers were kept locally in the church wire parishes, and there had been a good bit of transcription <coughs> going on before that. So some transcription work survived as well. And what survives now of church wire records is kept at the representative church body library in Dublin. And if we look um, at their um, listing, we see that Blarney, which by the way is composed of the two civil parishes of Garnetine and Whitechurch, those two combined form the parish of Blarney, we can see from the, 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 their listing that uh, things are not so good. So green shows records lost in 1922, and yellow is what's surviving. So we can see baptisms going back to 1799, and artists <coughs> have been destroyed, and uh, Whitechurch, very little there as well. So, learning has lost out quite a bit. Um, even worse, if we look at uh, Mazir Brady, that's only Brady, you might know his, name, his book, um, he tells us that the register for Garrett, that a register for Garrett Line was formed in 1798. So that would predate the baptism record that was lost in 1922. So apparently there was a register. Um, Dating back further than that, which was destroyed in 1798. So, Protestant records are not very good at all. Um, we can use substitutes. You know, there, we can we can look at the, the census of religion from 1766. That gives us the surname of the uh, Protestant parishioners in Blarney. And you can see some of them with a bit of a northern ring. That would be because the village was being laid out by the local landlord, the Jeffreys family, uh, as an industrial village, and they attracted some industrialists from the north, people who were skilled in the linen industry. Um, now, if you go back to that listing, you'll see that there are surviving records from 1846 under marriages for Garrick Line, which encompasses Blarney Village. And of course, you know, the, 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 I suppose the people in the upper strata of society, and uh, more has come down to us about them, and we see there from 1846 a newspaper account of the marriage of Sir George Coulthurst and, uh, and an heiress of the Jeffreys family. So it was written up quite well. It is a very good record of a marriage. Uh, it tells us all about um, bows being erected, arches of bows being erected um, on the road between Barney and Cork. Um, lunch at Grenville House, Grenville Place. That was interrupted by the squalling of fiddlers outside the window. They were trying to celebrate the marriage as well, but it was, I think it was only the poor that were being entertained. And then in the evening time, Carl Barrens set a blaze on the summit of Caraba in Inniscarra and also on the top of Blarney Castle to celebrate that marriage. So that's a very detailed record of the marriage, but again, the social status that created that. <coughs> and now, if we return to Catholic records, um, apparently the earliest surviving Catholic record is this one here from Wexford in 1671. It isn't too easy to make it out, but 1671. And to me it looks like James Sinnott. And Sinnott would be, I suppose, a name fairly typical of that part of the country. And it's um, quite, quite far back, 18th, 16th, 17th century. There are some records from Galway and Waterford from the 1680s. They be the earliest Catholic records that survived. Um, and it does seem to be the case that urban centres and the east coast would have the earlier records. As you go further west, especially into uh, more remote and densely populated and poor areas of the west and uh, the northwest, uh, records can be very late starting. They can even be as late as the 1860s and uh, later than civil registration. Civil registration came in in 1864, which was introduced by the government. And there you can see a poster detailing uh, the requirements of the law for civil registration. Now, what looks interesting here is that the 
penalty for neglecting to register at birth was 20 shillings, to register at death was 20 shillings, but at marriage, the penalty for the husband for neglect was 10 pounds. So, so, how uh, regularly it was enforced. And um, some people still tend to mix up civil registration, civil records, and parish records. So, civil, civil registration, 1st of January 1864, a legal requirement by the government. Parish records, as we see, Black and Church, going much further back. No, um, some sample start dates, and particularly the parish we're going to look at tonight. Catholic baptisms, 1791, for marriages, 1778. We come to Dunmore, a large Midcourt rural parish, slightly later but still quite early. Granada, quite late, probably later than average. The average start date, somewhere between in the Scarab, 1814, and, and Granada, 1840. And then we have urban centres, including Mallow and much, much earlier. And I believe that the earliest of all Cork Catholic records would be St. Mary's and St. Anne's, the North Cathedral, 1748. So there are some sample dates. Now that might give you the impression that you're never going to find a Grenade record before 1840. That's not always the case. If you look at Abbey Leaks up the country a little bit, um, the, the start date is somewhere in the 1830s, but um, there is a parish of Madden Kill, and that covers some of the, the townlands that normally go to the <coughs> So, looking at Madden Kill, you could find Abbey Leaks records. And there's something similar here with Grenade. If you're looking at the more, more Abbey records, you see, can see a baptism from 1838, which is two years before the Grenade family or the Grenade records start, and it is for the Bartholomew of Owens, and um, uh, it's under the more Abbey records. So that column then just happened to be covered at that time by the uh, more heavy parish red parts. Um, they say that burial records um, are not very common uh, in, in Catholic parishes, and that's particularly the case in the southern half of the country. The northern half of the country, you will some, find some burial records, but uh, down around here, mainly <coughs> baptism and marriage. You don't get burial very often. There you have an example from one of the Gara Opera Records, dating from National Library website. Um, language, just a word on that. Early records were kept in Latin, generally in Latin, um, and, and then English began to take over. And uh, Latin would tend to have what seemed to have been more, more use of in Irish speaking districts, where the Irish language was still strongest, the records would be kept in Latin and then in English ones for the last of longer. And the received wisdom is that it's either Latin or English, but never Irish. And that's essentially true. Uh, but as we'll see in a while, there's an exception with Blarney. Uh, we'll see that there's an exception language wise there. So that's typically Blarney being awkward again. And if you're looking over Latin records, um, <coughs> they can be quite intimidating at first first glance, and uh, but we can see that a lot of the words are repeated. So, baptism, by baptized, filium, son, you'll see those repeating all the time. Christian names tend to be Latinized, but the surnames not. And so they stand out quite clearly. Um, all too often, our parish records are very brief. Not even the word and or to are included. And here you have the date, you have the names, that's it. There's no other type of word up there at all other than those. That's the same with a marriage record, both goes to from Bernie. Again, names, maybe a squiggle friend, Daniel Lidori and Julia Duggan, um, but nothing else in that particular record. But it is legible, I suppose that saying something for it. And of course we can understand too that record keeping mightn't have been accorded as high a priority in times of poverty. Do you know? Life was often a struggle, poverty or times of persecution also, the keeping of records, <coughs> not a high priority. 
And you might be looking to get an address. Um, it's, it's, it's fabulous when you get an address because you can pinpoint the family within a parish. And uh, what addresses, they may have been recorded for a period and then neglected for another period. And so they're not always um, going to appear. And for example, in this particular record on screen at the moment. And an address will usually be a townland name or a locality name, the locality the family were in. Um, but brief as they are, you know, every record tells a story. You have individuals with life stories behind them and before them, but before this date and after that date. Um, and then just trying to construct that story, which is often uh, the, the thing that we try to do with that is genealogy. But of course this is the schedule or the frame that we can start or, or a thing of like that. Rarely do we see a parish record as detailed as this one. It's a baptism at the Unitarian Church from 1816. I don't know if you can read it. It is October 27th, Catherine MacDonald, a free Negro woman from Mervitsa in South America, who at the age of nine years had been carried away from her home country, Abu, in Western Africa. Now aged 30, was baptized immediately after morning service at the desk of our meeting house by her own particular desire after due instruction. So that's the Unitarian Church down there in Princess Street and it is a very vivid record compared to the two that I showed you just before it. Now, um, we're getting on to Blarney proper and some of the uh, AFOS project done some years ago, long before the internet got up and running, um, has proved uh, a great lead into the Blarney Parish records and one little side project was a listing of parish priests that those volunteers compiled and we can see them dating back to as far as 1704 and up to the end of the 19th century and uh, we won't be going beyond that in our, in our presentation tonight. Um, and it's from James Lassan's time, I think my red light is, is gone, so we have to do without that. James Lassan is fourth down, and it's from his time that the earliest parish records survive. And, uh, um, I suppose Glissan might read as Gleason, I think as Gleason today, but that's how it was rendered at the time. So now there's his signature, uh, Latinized, um, on the front of um, the earliest parish register. And you can see underneath his name is Pastor, the White Church, and Gary Cly, the combined parishes that made up the parish of Blarney. Um, so again, filling out the story, um, I came across in the Hibernian Chronicle a little piece of Oclesan and his house being broken into in 1786. And poor Father Oclesan, he was forced out of bed and the bed was retained as part of the, of the rage. <laughs> and at that time, there was a lot of resentment against the charges that not only the Church of Ireland were exacting, but also the Catholic clergy. They were able to pay to two churches, their own and another. And all of those charges were quite high. It is reckoned about a half crown was a typical marriage fee around that time, 1780s, and that was the equivalent of 10 days' work for a labourer. So, and there was resentment towards that, and that's probably the reason why he, his house was raided. But at the same time, uh, Father Clissan was left with some outstanding and uh, early parish records. I hope we got his bed close back in there. So, the baptisms are in three volumes, uh, beginning in 1791, as you can see there. And typically, as in most Irish parishes, there are gaps. So you can see from those dates that you have a whole generation missing, really, between 1792 and 1821. Those baptisms just aren't there. And on our next slide, then, you'll see roughly the uh, <coughs> I have them there at 10 year intervals. So you can see them rising towards the famine, of course, hitting a peak actually in 1849, and then a decline. There's a, a decline then as the 19th century wears on. Although it has to be said that it was the White Church segment of, of Blarney Parish that suffered more in the famine. That was more rural 
very difficult industry, and people um, uh, often boast that, well, I don't want to say forced, but they claim that it was a death in Blarney village from the family. But White Church did suffer quite a bit. No, the very first, uh, the very first baptism record from the Sands time is here, to 1791, and um, it, is, uh, it is quite legible. Um, you can see August 12, 1791, and the very first individual has claimed the fame to Darby Buffaly. And then you can see father and mother, John Buffaly and Mary Horgan, and then the sponsors, Callie and Lean, and Honor, uh, Honor Sullivan. So the very, very first baptism. And we would render Darby Buckley now as Jerry Buckley, or Jeremiah Buckley. You just won't see the name Buckley in records from this far back. <coughs> it was rendered Buckley, probably closer to the three Irish, I suppose, who so we'll maybe in pronunciation. And it's what's interesting from a local point of view is that um, this predates any of the churches that now exist in Bernie. Uh, the little church of Waterloo, I don't know if you know it or not, you can see it, especially passing the train, you see the accompanying round tower. That wasn't constructed until 1817. And the church in the village wasn't constructed until more or less the end of the time period we're looking at tonight. It wasn't constructed in the 1890s. So where did this baptism take place? Well, that's local history for you. It really opens up questions all the time, which are very interesting to explore. And we do know that there was a church in a town land called Nathlesso, which was the modern, apparently the stones went into the building of a nearby farmhouse, and perhaps that's where this hill out So possibly that little church, or possibly at home, many marriages and baptisms would have taken place in the home back then as well. But certainly not in the existing church. <coughs> um, I think you'd agree that the um, presentation is very good, very, very readable, that far back in time. But it, it is an English <coughs> as opposed to Latin. Um, so then we have a break and we don't get back on track again for till 1821. And I don't know who took over, but it was a different kind of man altogether, but my collection is in here somewhere. So his father, Father John Dooley. Father John Dooley took over and um, you know you wonder, was there a ruler? As in some people are trying to say times in the parish at all. And the, the writing is all over the place. But look, at least the records were back in action and they were being recorded, which was the main thing. Uh, overall, as I briefly mentioned, Blarney's parish records are very good presentation wise. They have a good time span and most of them are very clearly presented. And um, that's not the case for so many of our parish parishes. It's very, very difficult <coughs> to try and decipher them. So, I mean, there's an, another example of a parish register and it's from Mitchellstown. <coughs> I just wouldn't like to be having to work through that, I have to say. So I had an easy enough task looking at the records for this presentation. Knowing knowing me and my crowd, I'd probably have to be trying to decipher a bit that runs into the black torn part and money where they'd be. So they are good from that point of view. Um, now in volume 2, moving into the 1830s, um, we have Father Matt Horgan. He is well settled into the parish. He is the guy who built the two long towers that are in the parish, one out at Waterloo, one out at White Church, and he also built schools. He was a Gaelic scholar. He was something of an archaeologist. He was associated with learned societies in the city, and he had quite a profile. I'd say he was a larger than life character. And that's something very true about parish records. Often the personality of the priest emerges, and I think you'll see this as we talk about Father Matt Horgan. And, and he puts in a lot of little additions, <coughs> a lot more colour and interest to Granny's records. So here he notes the arrival of um, a colleague, the Reverend Alexander Payton, who became my co editor um, on this particular date. So his time is, is very interesting, really. Um, no. Just looking at various trends, um, if we remember the statistics we looked at a while ago, it was
you'll see that in pre famine times, a baptism was being conducted on average every three to four days. The birth rate was such. And uh, often there were several in one day. Sundays and holidays, they seem to have been the busiest. So, for example, here in 1832, um, we have 15 baptisms for January, and five of them occurred on New Year's Day. That would be a holiday, presumably, at the time. So, five of those there on the first, the first of January. <coughs> now, Granny's books at that time were kept up in White Church. That's where the priests were keeping them. Um, and any additions from Granny proper from the village, etc., they were added later. And you can imagine that uh, details, they might often get forgotten. They might be noted on scraps of paper. Scraps of paper might go astray, fall out of the priest's pocket as he gave up on the horse, after conducting a baptism in the home, something like that. And so, so we know that some must have slipped through the grave that way also. Particularly if you look at this example, you can see July appears one, two, three, four, five times on just two pages, with all these additions being added in. Baptisms in July 1839. And this one is interesting. It looks like the record wasn't fully forgotten, but the priest seems to have forgotten the father's surname. So we see the first <laughs> bit the first of it, the first bit of fool's day as well. And it's, uh, it's Mary, and she was baptized to Cat Catherine Buckley and Mick, whoever Mick was. <laughs> so there's a story there as to why, why that would be forgotten. Now the third book of baptisms, that begins in 1845, and Morris Kenefick, he's based up in Whitechurch, and Daniel Casey is down in Blarney, and they're making most of the entries. And again, it's very, very neatly kept, and a new column is introduced, and this column is residence, address in other words. And that information hadn't been kept since James Glissant's time, 50 years before in the 18th century. So we have residences being recorded again. Now what's very interesting, of course, about this, possibly unique in the country, I don't know, but as far as I'm aware, um, John, John uh, Brennan, um, in his book, at least in the edition I have, which is, is about one or two editions old, says that you don't see Irish in the parish records. And here, of course, we have the residence being recorded in beautiful Gaelic script on the right hand side from 1849. And we know that Father Matt Horrigan was a great fan of the Irish language, and he, he may have been keeping that himself, he may have been encouraging his curates to do so. So, running down Trunan, you've Killing Daniel, three, three ones down you've Flat Pekin, below that you've Temple Gill, which is White Church. So all the local areas, <coughs> beautifully kept. And of course, having a residence is a very useful bonus for family research purposes because it pinpoints a family within a townland in a parish. Um, from a local history point of view, there are some very interesting residences for Clarity because they are places that have now disappeared. People don't know them. So Hunting Hill appears, Tory's Bed, which is a very evocative name, and luckily we have Carrick Navarre written under it. So it's a way over the extreme end of the White Church Parish, uh, coming close to Carrick Navarre. Salt Field, that's up in White Church, and Iron Mills, that was the Shovel Mills in Monard, where it was a beautiful film in the 1940s, a black and white film when the mills were still operating in a beautiful, secluded, wooded valley, tree ponds coming on in a stream, families associated for generations, it was called the Shuttle Mills, the Island Mills, and it was <coughs> considered an address at that time. Black Peak and West, you rarely hear of West or East for that, and Waterloo, I think that is from somewhere in the 1840s, and it looks like, the, it looks the first written mention of the name Waterloo that I could find. And presumably it commemorated the Battle of Waterloo, which was considerably earlier. But anyway, there is written evidence of it being used in the 1840s. And then suddenly, another name that you won't find much anymore. So they all appear in the records under the residence column. Now, all the valley, we have two townlands, Kilon and Kulon. And then there's Kilines, which is quite near, um, even though it's not technically in Barry. And Still to this day, we're always getting them mixed up. You know, 
you know what a family done with cool oil? What do you mean done with cool oil? Cool oil is up. No, that's kilo. Kilo oil, you're talking about kilos. So we still get them mixed up. And you can see that back in 1880, they were doing the same thing. Maybe it was a curate, Luke's the parish. But anyway, Hanora, Dinan, she's done as cool on the right hand side there. But it seems that kilo oil was crossed out. So that, that curate perhaps didn't know his kilo oil from his cool oil. Now, this little insert um, is a marriage certificate, and um, again, it does show, I suppose, a little bit of character, personality. It's, a, it's probably a rough draft, which was left in the register, um, but Matt Horgan has done a little fish, perhaps a Christian symbol of the fish, just at the end of it, and uh, we have the detail kept as well. So his personality immediately emerges from the records, to my mind. Um, here you see a little note inserted uh, on the 24th of July 1842. You have William. He was baptized into William Mapper and Mary Lee. And there's a note saying, Father in America. So, you know, it's a marvelous little bit of family history. And in this slide, you have the baptism of twins, William and Johanna, and the word twins, Julie, written in, with four sponsors. So there was a busy church that day. And there's more additions like that. Um, in the top one here, you have the word travelers added. Now that opens our imaginations, but what does it mean with travelers? Were they commercial travelers coming around with oil pads or something like that? Or were they kind of traditional travelers uh, journeying through the country with a caravan? And below then, you have a, a Honora baptized and a little addition say Peregrini. Peregrini, which essentially means travellers also. It, it could have a connection with vagrant or travelling. And Peregrini signifies travelling or being away from one's native parish. Being away from one's native parish. And the ultimate Peregrini would be the likes of St. Saint Saint Patrick, St. Columba who not only left their homes, but went abroad, went far abroad on missionary zeal. They'd be the ultimate peregrini. Perhaps it just means travellers here. And um, in our next slide then, we have a few more little additions. We see a Johanna baptised on the 13th of a particular month, and the mother's name given, but no father's name. There are sponsors, and then the addition of Vega, Vaga, BB, now, I don't know what Vega means, maybe somebody can tell us here, because I haven't worked it out, but or maybe Vagrant or Travelling also. And uh, BB, I think it was you, maybe that one, Karen, it was stand for Base Born, Low Born, Base, you know, like Pies Bass, the, the French word for Low Countries, so BB, Base Born. <coughs> and um, I was telling this to some, some of the guys in Blarney who were interested in history, and I said to them, the word bastard doesn't appear in the Clarion records at all. And they said, so why would it? There's not many bastards in Clarion. They have to have themselves. So that's what it means, of course, uh, base form. And, uh, and we have it again in the lower one, with dots around it for some reason. And a, I think it's a Peter. And there's, there is the two parents. <coughs> there are the, the um, sponsors. But there's a little note saying, from Burnford Parish. Burnford would lie between Clarion and Mallow. And Sometimes in the legitimate birth, when that was due, the mother, or maybe the couple, they would move into a neighbouring parish for the birth. And to avoid social stigma, keep a low profile. Maybe that's an example of that. And other words pop up in other parish records um, for, for that. And uh, I think there's something you should be actually Karen, such as natural child. Um, spurious, misbegotten, patterly naughty, which means father unknown, and furious, populi, meaning unidentified local man. <laughs> oh, probably wasn't local anymore. <laughs> <laughs> probably got the hell out of it. <laughs> so, again, you know, it gives us a sense of the times. We can hope that people were treated with mercy, of course, but that doesn't emerge. You know, but what we see, we see, and the record itself. Um, now, you know, perhaps they were the lucky ones. Um, infanticide was by no means rare in the 19th century, and neither was the discovery of foundlings, uh, babies found. 
and there are records of those in the Glarney Parish records. And just as an aside, it is the, the Holy Innocents are the patron of fallen things. The Holy Innocents that heard and <coughs> destroyed. <coughs> so some of those examples, um, here is a very poignant one. September 1834, the 10th of September. And the only uh, inscription is the baby's name, William. There's no parents' names and there's no sponsors. So this was a fun thing in 1834. And there was um, a high proportion of them were found um, before the famine time, before the 1830s. There was a lot of them found, was found in the parish. And I suppose that was a time of a booming population. The population was growing throughout the country before the famine hit. So maybe it ties in with that, with that kind of social trend. But mind you, there's also a record where the baby has no name. So this isn't the fun thing. This could be another example of, uh, of a case where the, the name was forgotten. So it was a baptism on the 19th of January 1842. The parents were given, sponsors were given, but no baby's name. So that's the baby with no name. Uh, another founding record is here, and uh, it's the 18th of November 1841. William again, I'm not too sure why that is. King William was never popular, but he, not even with the English themselves, but he was gone off the throne at that stage. And um, the priest seems to have, or somebody seems to have given him a surname that sort of wanted to give him a fighting chance in life. So he was baptized as William Champion, and then the word founding is added. Now, of course, perhaps he was taken by the family, and he might have been known as Billy Murphy on his life, but he was baptized as William Chapman in the beginning. And then you have a John Sylvester, also a founding, with sponsors. And um, Sylvester, well, you know, in, in Latin, it sort of stems from of the woods. Was he found among trees or in a wood? Uh, we don't know, but Sylvester was the name chosen for him. And St. Forsey is a uh, you know, the Holy Innocents are the patron of is it fun things? Yeah, Holy Innocents are the patron for fun things. Oh yeah, St. Forsey, what did he do? He he was said to have brought the, the twins of Chieftain back to life. That's what he was supposed to have said to have done. And in the parish of Inniscarra, a neighbouring parish, um, there are three foundings in the 1820s, and they were given the name Forzi, or Forzius. So perhaps there's a connection there with that story. He brought the twin children of the Chieftain back to life. Um, out further, towards McGorney, which would be coached for direction, and the Church of Ireland up there, there was a found in death at the church door in 1789, and he was christened as Timothy Porch. <laughs> <laughs> and then we learned something about weather conditions with the baptism of Bridget Snow at St. Pinbar's Cathedral. In a, that was in January 1784. And a week later, Henry Paul was baptized. <laughs> <laughs> he was baptized in the same cathedral. That would be the other building before the, the present one went up. Um, like there, there seems to be some kind of happy endings, maybe. In 1832, the mother appears to have come forward in a Blarney case because her name is, is, is added, um, with the word founding is still in the record. And in 1882, the parents' names have been added, uh, even though the ink is different, it's definitely a later edition. Now, this particular record here. Is, it's almost as evocative as the Unitarian record of the African woman that I showed you a while ago. It's an adult baptism. It's the 6th of December, 1838, and it's Jeremiah Murphy. You can see the word founding underneath his name, and it says an adult baptism, and then it's at Cardinalot Cross. Now, Cardinalot Cross is still a rural crossroads. I can't think that it changed much since these days. But there's a story there, you know, Jeremiah, he was up at the crossroads, not too far from the presbytery of the priest's house, got talking to people, scratching his head, but they don't get baptized at all. Gee, they got to get rid of the church, 
baptized or even at Christmas, which was on the way, it might have been a particularly poignant Christmas for him, you know, whatever his life story was. Now there's a case in 1839 for a very unusual name, figuring in the in the records, and it's just William Granmeal. There's nothing more said to about it than that. It has a kind of German ring to it, I thought. And um, there's there's also other adult baptisms. There's a note from 1854 saying, received into the Catholic Church on the 1st of January, Miss Sophia Sandham of Fermoy, in the presence of Dr. Lee and Eliza Jane O'Donoghue and many others. So that was a conversion, uh, an adult baptism into the Catholic Church. Um, 1842, you have a Henry, and he was baptized to Henry Chafin, same name, and Elizabeth Chafin. And then you can see on the right hand side, ex parte Protestants. So, must be some kind of conversion again. And um, we know that the mother's name is not her maiden name, which was, that was a traditional way of entering records in the, the Protestant denominations. You, you, you didn't put in the, maid, the, the, the mother's own maiden name. But in Catholic records, it was always the maiden name. As you can see in the record below, where you have Timothy Hegarty and Bridget Murphy baptizing in John. And then your Morris Kenfix name as the celebrant there. Um, here's another um, interdenominational baptism, if you like. It's a John Barry, and here the parents are left out, unlike the last record. It's not to say that they were Protestants. That's all uh, that's, all that's put in. The sponsor of their name, all right. Would it become for adults to have sponsors? I suppose they would have required them. I would have been required for an adult as much as for a baby. Okay. I'm not totally certain that, but I would have thought. Now, Father MacCorrigan is coming to the end of his time uh, around that slide. Um, he died quite a little bit of man. Um, and his co editor, which we saw earlier on, Alexander Payton, he was still with him and he became parish priest. And I think it's kind of fair to say that, especially post famine times, the registers get a little bit duller. There's not as much of the little additions and the little character in it. Um, and maybe that's so dull that one particular curate seems to have been very bored, and he <laughs> did quite a flourish of his signature. So that kind, of, that kind of brightened it up there towards the end of Father Matt's time, when, when he was finished up. Daniel Casey, Senator. And there certainly was a big turnover in curates throughout the 1850s. You have Father Leader being removed to Castle Martyr, John O'Duffin to Kilbrin, this is all the Dice of Klein, of course, Father Duggan to Clandrugget, and Dennis Murray down to Queenstown, and he was replaced by Father Daly from New Market. Is it saying something about Father Payton? I don't know. But Father Payton did do a lot of good work in the parish, and he did um, renovate Waterloo Church, he more or less rebuilt it, more or less rebuilt it. But we do see a note on a baptism, which sounds just very slightly peeved, you know, it's a baptism, and only, the, only, it looks like only the father's name is put in, the baby's name added, and the mother's name added, and then a note saying, purists did not give the names. Do you know, so, maybe the father's name was very exacting, we don't know. Anyway, um, Father James McCarthy was his successor, and we see a nice detailed note um, about, about him um, um, when, when he came at the end of his time around 1871. He served just, uh, just under 10 years and he died at 8 Marlborough Street uh, where his medical advisors uh, were. And there were 52 priests at his funeral. How they all packed into the church, I don't know. That was probably the Waterloo Church. And he was described as a saintly and amiable. And he was succeeded by David Parker. He was 1871 to 1896. Um, and it was in his time that the present church in the village, you might know it's been passed through Garney, it's been on a hill opposite the Wooden Mills. I'm sure you've been on the sales. You might just plant the church when you're turning into the, the Wooden Mills. Uh, so it was David Parker's time that that was built. And he was succeeded by David Lynch, sorry, Dennis Lynch, who remained until 1911. 
Uh, another feature, perhaps, in the, 19th, in the later 19th century is maybe kind of this change in concept of respectability. And um, you see little bits of evidence of that creeping in. I think one would be the introduction of Sepin. Of Sepin, yes. They, they never appeared before the late 19th century. And these are quite early examples, really. So you have um, on the 29th of August, perhaps, uh, 1879, to Peter John. So John is the second name. And then you have Mary Bridget. So perhaps an effort at um, kind of respectability, changing customs, anyway, certainly. No. Oh, yeah, there's one uh, uh, entry as well, I don't have a slide of it, where the initials P and G are added, back to the father's name. And that would stand for poor law guarantee. So that would be you know, quite a respectable position in society. Might not be necessary to put it in, but, but it's there. And one thing I meant to mention about Father Matt Horgan's records was the use of diminutives. And they're full of diminutive names, like, like uh, Peggy and Mick, uh, Pat, and, uh, and those. There seems to be kind of a real kind of everyday life feel about the records from that time, back in the 1830s, as opposed to the more formal records of the later decades. Um, now, having said that, um, you do get a few little additions, and 1865, a very poignant note saying that the birth was the death of the mother. And, you know, very, very, very sad, but it didn't need to be added, I suppose, but it maybe so, made such an impact that it was put in by the priest at that time. And there's something similar from pre times where the word uh, posthumous, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that was added, and apparently a posthumous baby is a baby who was born after his father died. Father had died in the interval. Posthumous baby. And other insertions in later decades are where somebody has um, checked up the baptism register and added a note about the marriage of that person. So you have two baptisms from the 1880s here, and some individuals have come along, perhaps the same individuals, perhaps related, perhaps the priest at the time, and they've added on that you know, this person uh, got married at St. John's Church, Clinton, Massachusetts, in 1917. And then Cornelius Callaghan, the baby baptized here, Cornelius Callaghan was married to Mary Mullins, St. Patrick's Church, 1915. So those are additions that were put in as well. And they become quite numerous at certain periods. Perhaps it was the practice of particular priests when they came looking for certificates and that. So now, just a little bit more about marriages, the baptisms that we've mostly talked about. And here you, we go back to James and his hands and again, and we see um, the cover sheet of the earliest marriage register. And the earliest marriage record is 1778, um, which is about 13 years earlier than the baptism records. Three books as well. And again, so beautifully kept from so far back. And the very, very first marriage record in the parish, we can see the first name is Latinized, and it is John. So it is John Sullivan and Catherine Donovan. And they're both of Gary Klein. So that's the piece that we'll cover with Ireland Village and surrounding Tomlands. And then you have that they were joined in matrimony, basically. Not too hard to make up the Latin. And we can see their, their uh, witnesses then as well. So a beautiful record really from so far back. It's almost as if Father Cassin knew that he was doing something for posterity. And we're here so much, so much later and able to see it. Like for the thanks, uh, thanks to technology. And um, one pattern um, up to about the 1840s anyway, or thereabouts, was for three witnesses to appear for a marriage. And often the surname is repeated. And they're nearly always all male. Do you know nowadays it's probably your best body as your, as your witness. But here you see Michael Hayes, Willie Hayes, Timothy Hayes, and they're sharing the same name as the bride, Julia Hayes. So it's like they're trying to see a good match made, you know. That I know it's Valentine's Day tomorrow, but this is a kind of secondary importance, you know, that hard economic um, partnership is nearly more important. And the next one, they have three lynches, lynch, 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 and a Mrs. Forrest. I don't know who she is, but uh, she, she got it herself on her as well. 
Um, no, that just brought to mind for me a couple of stories. One from Eamon Kelly. And do you remember Eamon Kelly? Yeah. And he told a story about adding to the number of cattle ties in the stall during match making. We put up a few extra cattle ties. We didn't have as many cattle for the cattle ties, but we still added a few so that they looked good, that you had more cattle than you had. <laughs> and then the opposite was true when you were applying for the pension. If the inspector came around, you took down the cattle ties to show that you didn't have as much beans as, as, uh, as he would think you had. Um, and the second gentleman then, William Lefanu, he was an engineer on the Cork Dublin railway line, and he lived at Back Pekin for a while, and he was in the parish of uh, White Church and Planning. And um, he recounted the case of a man who boasted of the kindness of his father in law. Said this man about his father in law, Should he give me his oldest daughter, and if he had an older one, he'd have given her to me. <laughs> <laughs> the farmers were very strict about marrying off their daughters in rotation, eldest first and then second to last. So again, in, in the early records, we see address information, and you can see that people came from far and wide to marry Barney women. They must have been marvelous altogether. You can see neighboring parishes like uh, Inniscarra, and I think that Cooney, um, Grenade, Carrie de Bar, Clan Moyer, uh, Cork, Henry Simmons came up from Cork, uh, Michael Dennehy from Curlica Pawn, Dunamore, and others. So all the surrounding areas, you can just picture these guys making the trip on the old country roads from long, long ago before they ever put traffic lights on the Scarlet Bridge or anything and they're, they're coming over to Barney for their marriage. And you have more from even further afield, so you have a look all the way up, about 13 miles or so, which Barry came on the way, and then you have Kilmurray uh, from the, in, in the Diocese of Cork. So somebody was saying, I think I said, um, Brendan Street Kilmurray, what's it? What do you mean? Um, Kilmurray, and then McGorney, which again we mentioned by the old, kind of equated with coach for Ahanalienta, that would be on the way to Moore Abbey, Clanmean, which would be kind of the anterior area, Ballyclough, and Kilbrin, possibly the furthest out. So all 18th century journeys to, to, to make their managers. What else have we got? Um, that's just again a 10 year sample of marriages, 17 recorded for 1779. I don't know why 1799 was so low. Maybe people thought the other world was nigh or something like that. And then, um, as you move through the 1830s, reaching a peak of 44 in 1839. And then declining a bit, most of the decline again would have been in the uh, White Church segment. But if we look at Dunmore, um, a very large rural parish badly hit by the famine, we can see that there was a peak of 76 marriages in 1839. Same year as Clarence Peak, 1839. And that fell to just three marriages in the parish of Dunmore in 1888. Extraordinary and changed, 76 down to three. That was an exceptional law, of course. Um, reading the bands, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was required in the church to, 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 to call out bands. It had to be done in the prospective groom's parish and the prospective bride's parish at three Sundays in a row or three days of obligation. And of course, the idea then was to um, see that there was no impediment to the proposed marriage, that there was no impediment. Um, now, they could be dispensed with, and they frequently were. And you can see, you can see the word dispensed and published there. But after Father James Glissant's time, you, you rarely see it, you rarely hear about the being recorded. Would they separate book? Uh, no, no, that like you, you have marriage records there, like the top one there, 1780. So you have John Kennedy of Dunmore and Julia Murphy of White Church. And then join the body of matrimony and sponsors, and then the bands were dispensed with. You see that? Um, consanguinity, that was noted in the early records as well. So it was particular rules about marriage. First degree of consanguinity would be siblings, and of course marriage was never allowed in that case. The second degree of consanguinity, that means relation to blood, would be first cousins, and the third degree of consanguinity would be second cousins. And you can see with this particular couple, uh, they were related on both sides, on the father's side to the second degree, and on the other side to the third degree. 
and a dispensation to be made for that. So that's what you see there. Um, here's quite an elaborate uh, note about consanguinity from 1844, um, related to the second degree on both sides, and it's bringing in the Pope and uh, Bishop Crotty at the time. So it's just explaining that um, dispensation has been received and approved, and the marriage can go ahead. Sometimes a marriage might take place, and the consanguinity might have been known about, or it might have been declared. And if that was discovered later, the marriage would have to be rehabilitated. So occasionally, you would see the word rehabilitation, meaning that the, the marriage is approved retrospectively. Now, Lent was an extraordinary time, and you might be a little bit aware of it, but as far back as 1563, 1563, the church the church uh, issued a rule that uh, marriage shouldn't take place during Lent, 1563. And that led to something of a misconception, I think particularly in Ireland, where people thought they had to get married before Lent. So, mad rush to the altar to get married, even though they could have waited there for Lent to get married, equally well. Um, and it pro produces extraordinary results. So, as far back as 1780, you have three marriages on February the 6th, and you have two more on February the 7th within the parish, and Ash Wednesday fell the following day, February the 8th, at like that year. And another example then, from some 80 years later, and we're still only at 1860, you can see February the 5th had one marriage, then there was four on February the 11th, another 16th, two on the 18th, and then the 21st. And Lent fell on the 27th, I'm sorry, Ash Wednesday fell on the 22nd of that year, and there wasn't another marriage then until May the 25th. So this kind of mad rush to get married, the priests must have been incredibly busy at that time. And if we skip over to Dunham War again, and we look at those 76 marriages in 1839, would you believe that 39 of those took place in February in 1839? That's, you know, considerably more than one a day. And incredibly, more incredibly still, 10, 10, 10 of them took place on the 10th of uh, February, and 22 of them took place on Shrove Tuesday, the 12th of February. How old they? 22 couples, I don't know. And so now, that's just a particularly fine example uh, from the Planet Parish Records. I was telling you how good they are for many periods. Um, it's again towards the end of Father Matt Horgan's time, and you can see his name, name just, just to the side here. And um, it's just so neatly laid out, the columns, and again, the, the script in Gaelic. And of course, we're in the famine time at this point. And th there must be kind of a sense that, um, you know, that a uh, bit of dignity or a bit of local pride or what was being preserved by, by maintaining such fine records at such a tragic time. Now we mentioned, you know, maybe scraps of paper, things falling between the, the grid and disappearing, um, so records getting lost, etc., as well as the larger gaps in, in records. But here we have an example of the opposite, where we seem to have a duplicate record. So it's the 9th of February is the top one, and it looks like Andrew, <coughs> Andrew Forrest, and um, he ties into my family tree, but he's not a direct ancestor, it's the same surname. So Andrew Forrest and Anstey McAuliffe got married. And the witnesses were Daniel and John McAuliffe, they expect that, you know, maybe the father and the brother of the bride, and uh, a John Forrest from the other side. Now three days later, Andrew Forrest is married Mary McAuliffe. And the witnesses are Daniel and Jan John McAuliffe, but Tim McCarthy. So it, it has to be um, the same marriage, <coughs> but entered twice with variations in detail. So, you know, basically, it, it shows that you may not get the exact correct information in, in a parish record, even if it is an original. You know, you're very likely to, but we can see here that the bride's first name differs, and that one of the sponsors also differs, and of course, the date differs by three days. But I'm convinced it's the same marriage, because I researched the family. She was Anastasia McAuliffe, that was her real name, but became known as Anne much more commonly. And I, I 
chase all their children, the baptisms, as far as they know, and I think Mary is a mistake. But it just shows that what can crop up um, in parish and words. <coughs> Um, here is an example of a mixed marriage, just a, a, a little addition there on the way inside. Um, curiously, there seems to have been a map by the name of Henry Lee in Blarney Forever. There's a, a famous map of the village that the Blarney Castle estate did out in the 1770s, and there's a Henry Lee depicted as being resident there. There's Henry Lee's marrying within the parish. Um, Every so often, 1794, 1844, 1895, 1925. So, and then I can remember about 10 years ago, my father mentioning the death of the Henry Lee. So, it seems to have been a man of that name forever in the parish. Um, but the majority of surnames um, that we see are names that are strictly associated with the south of Ireland with Cork. You know, they're, they're the surnames that we see mostly. We will get strictly in English names that crop up in, in Blarney's records. So we'll probably be English men or English women resident briefly, maybe. <coughs> Others like uh, Wiseman and uh, perhaps Ingleton, they will be English names well established in, in the country. And also there seems to be some European names. Uh, Herbert Lachette, he was a music teacher and he lived in Blarney for a while and married. Wise man, we've always got to be mostly West Cork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just have to go down there. There'll be a few families in the Blarney area, but they're probably West Cork groups, but they've been there for a long time. So we're coming towards the end, and I'm just having a mention of some naming patterns. I'm conscious of keeping a little down a bit too now. And just surveying the index that the FOSS project did on the records back in the 1980s, and we see that Murphy is the most commonly appearing name. So that's probably not too surprising. It occupies 23 pages of the baptism index. That's followed by Manny then at a much reduced 10. But we always will pronounce the name Manny. I know kind of like we say Manny, maybe the, the pronunciation Manny is disappearing. And the same with Walsh. My own mother was Walsh. But it was always pronounced Welsh. Um, so you can see that the, the most popular names there, the most commonly appearing names. Um, now, of, uh, um, you do get surname variation, and um, you can see you might just have one variant, such as Healy there, for example, appearing, and Mark Flynn. Um, Flynn and Fowlo, they're very uh, early, a bit like Buckley, they appear in the very early records. Fowlo to me looks very kind of Englishy, but it really is much closer to the Irish pronunciation of the name of Fowlo, isn't it? And then coming on lower, then you see more variations, such as in Reardon. And Reardon with the I is the second letter, and Reardon with the A is, or the E is the second letter. Maybe about equal numbers back in the 19th century. And then Linnan, and you've mentioned them as well. So there are variations that appear. Um, as for first names, look, the people in the 19th century just were not very daring. You know, these 10 male names and these 10 female names, they truly cover the vast majority of children being baptised in the parish of Blarney and probably most Irish parishes, especially in the south of Ireland, in the 19th century. Now, John and Mary could well account for about a quarter of all baptisms you know, in the 19th century. And indeed, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Um, <coughs> there's 149 Murphy males who married in Blarney Parish up to 1895. Of that 149, 127 are covered by those 10 names. You know, that's 85% of Murphy grooms who have had those 10 names. So here we can see them. Daniel was most popular. Um, it, it, it just seems to have been more popular with the Murphy surname, whereas John, of course, would have been nationally by far the most popular. But Daniel won out, and indeed Michael as well, over John with Murphy. So you can see the numbers as you scale down. They begin to thin out towards the end when you get to say maybe Bartholomew and Thomas, and then you're down into just one of Florence and uh, Martin, etc. Um, 
In, in the 18th century, and we saw that those couple of decades of 18th century records, the imagination seems to have been wider. People seem to have been more kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of more encompassing. And there are names that appear in a couple of decades of the 18th century that never appear again in the 19th century. So we can show you a few of those in the years. So Helena, Marguerite, Elaine, Eleanor, Eleonora, Joan, Helen, Hester, and Laura. They all appear in those years, but you never see them again. So there was probably a wider imagination at that time. Now, if you want to be a total anorak altogether, and I just took mine off there so I can't come to that, these are all the grooms' names that appear in the Blarney Marriage Registers up to 1895. And there's a few unusual ones, I suppose, and the 10 most common are there, of course, covering the vast majority, but there are some unusual ones. And I suppose among them are Brian, spelled with a Y, uh, Benjamin, Redmond, Matthias, Marcus, Cain, which is you might know yourselves as traditional with the name Nanny. Um, it's really a variation of, of Kian, I think, which is now popular again. And Carol, that was traditional with Daly. And the most unusual one of all that I came across in the Daly records is Ineam. Ineam Daly from 1810. I thought first it might be an anima for I name. It could be again an example of a priest who forgot the name and just made up an anima. But perhaps it's some kind of Latin variation. Maybe somebody could, could tell us that it was there in the Daly records. We're almost there now, guys. So, I don't know how many of you would agree that there's a Demetrius in the family history. Maybe you have a nephew or, a, or maybe a niece who's married a, a Demetrius who's a Greek or something. But as we saw, first names were Latinized. We all have Demetrius in our, in our family history. There's no doubt about it. But would they have been known as Demetrius? Hardly. You know, maybe Dermot, Dermot, Darby, Jeremiah, or Jerry. You know. Do you remember the film Darby O'Gillan and Little People? Yeah. I always thought, you know, look, there's no way I should be called Darby, you know, but Paddy, fair enough for Mick, but there's no Darby's. But if you go back to the early records, Darby's everywhere. Do you know, it, was, it really was the Paddy of its day. And so just to finish up then, we have a lovely story by William Carlton, if anybody's read it at all. Then it's so short, honestly, goes to the youth. So this was a budding genius in his rural community, and he was destined for the youth because his brains were such that he was. He earned a place there. But as he was going off to study, he announced to his parents and his neighbours that henceforth he wanted to be known as Dennis or Dionysius, anything but that vulgar epithet, Dimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to an end of our our own true garments parish records.